<laughs> Thank you very much, uh, honorable members. A very good morning to yourself. Thank you once again for, for the nomination and uh, election. Um, welcome to the meeting of the portfolio committee. Uh, the agenda is flighted. Uh, Marsh, can I can I check uh, uh, Chileka? Please, can I check if there are apologies uh, on your side? Uh, yes, Mr. Uh, so we have an apology for Deputy Minister So you, the DG, uh, Ms. Chabalala. Um, Honorable Ganjo has requested to leave at uh, 12. Uh, she has a matter that she needs to attend to. Uh, also, the parliamentary uh, law uh, legal advisor, she's having another meeting, so she won't be with us. Oh, I see uh, DG's hand is up, but I did get an apology for her. Can we get uh, that hand, DG? Good morning. Good morning, uh, uh, Honorable Chair. Uh, good morning to the members. I just want to indicate that, yes, I've managed to join virtually. Uh, my apologies were mainly because the meeting was going to be physical and was not going to be in the physical meeting that was planned earlier. But now that it's virtual, yes, I am. I am in the meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, uh, DG. Further apologies? Gift hand is up, uh, Mr. Matisse. Who's hand? Gift. Uh, gift. Good morning, Appeal members. Good morning, members. Good morning, Chair uh, and my colleagues. I just wanted to, to, to pass Minister's apology that she may or she may not join because she's got a press conference now in the morning. Uh, so we'll just see her. Maybe she'll come in. Is she not in the meeting now? Mm, I don't see the name now. I've been checking. I just want okay, to I guess, that, noted. I guess that leaves us with the DG as the leader of the delegation. Um, can we then get a mover for the adoption of the agenda? Honorable Chair, members. Chair, before... Uh, uh, I move for the adoption of agenda. Uh, I'm trying to uh, get a, an appointment for my physio due to my ankle. So if I do get it, I would request to be uh, to, to be released. And I move for the for the adoption of the agenda. It is noted. Thank you, Honorable Mbata. Uh, any seconder for the adoption? Mr. Singh's sure. hand. Oh, yes, Mr. Honorable C. Yeah, the Chairperson, no, I second uh, uh, the agenda, but I must say it's unfortunate that uh, no member of the executive is present in this very important uh, meeting, especially the first half. And I hope that uh, Gift takes very copious notes so that he can pass on whatever we discuss to the minister and the deputy minister. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Singh. Uh, Zoni, can I check if Zoni is here? Zoni Gift, the PLO of the Deputy Minister is here? Yes, definitely, sure, Honorable Chair. I'm here, Honorable Chair. Good morning. Yeah. We will request yourself and uh, Gift to take notes on behalf of your principals uh, with hope that uh, the minister will join the proceedings. Um, with that being said, honorable members, thank you once again. Uh, can we straight? Can we shoot straight to the briefing by the conservation uh, uh, action uh, on the current state of the captive lion breeding in South Africa? Um, thank you, uh, Acting Chair, and good morning to the honourable members of this committee. Um, my name is Tony Gerrans. I'm the Executive Director of HSI, and I'm presenting here today on behalf of the Conservation Act of, uh, Action Trust. Could I please ask the um, administrator of the meeting to allow me to share the screen? Ah, thank you. Yes, you may. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Can you see now? 
So um, thank you. I will talk for about 15 or 20 minutes and then um, uh, also leave a little bit of time for questions. So uh, thank you again for this opportunity. I'm sure everyone in this committee does know that South Africa is one of the uh, only a few African countries that allow the breeding and keeping of predators in captivity for commercial ends. We have at the last official count uh, some 366 captive facilities that were registered in terms of the Biodiversity Act. We know um, that in 2019, nearly 200 lion skeletons or carcasses were exported uh, from South Africa, mainly to Asian countries. The estimated captive lion population at the last census, which was back in 2019, was about 8,000 animals. And we believe now the best information is that that population might be between 10 and 12,000 animals. At the same time, wild lion populations have declined materially over the last 20 years, and we may have only as few as 3,000 lions living in the wild. How the industry works um, is that these animals are often exploited throughout their entire life. Um, they are separated from cubs from the mothers, and uh, revenue is generated by allowing cub petting. When the animals are sub-adults, when they're juveniles, there is a host of different type of animal interactions which are sold to the tourist industry. When they are mature, they are typically hunted and the hunting is often by way of a canned hunt, which doesn't allow any semblance of fair chase. And most of the lion's bones are exported for profit once the lion has been killed. This gives rise to a whole range of welfare harms um, and the NSPCA has issued report, repeated notices to breeders um, amounting uh, to contraventions of Section 2 of the Animals Protection Act, 1971 of 62, relating to the circumstances in which these lions are kept. You can see that cub on the left of the screen has severe neurological damage. This cub was rescued as a number of animals by the NSPCA from an active lion breeding facility where she was not afforded any veterinary treatment. Typically, the problems related to how these animals are kept in captivity includes poor diets, poor hygiene, lack of shelter, poor uh, enclosure design, the total absence usually of veterinary treatments, and the absence of any type of enrichment. Uh, this is, uh, amounts to systemic contraventions of the Animals Protection Act and any definition of welfare, including the five freedoms. We also have the question of how these animals are slaughtered um, because much of the slaughter happens outside of the formal legal framework. Uh, the other harms that the industry uh, induces is firstly, there's a massive risk of zoonotic disease, zoonotic disease being the disease that is passed from animals to humans, uh, a substantial and persistent illegal trade in lion body parts, uh, which provides a cover then for the poaching of wild animals, the industry has recognized now to have no value for the conservation of animals in the wild. And though it does employ some people, the jobs are typically dangerous and few and far between. You can see just a sample of the peer reviewed literature and reports that have been produced about the harms of this industry attached there in the slide. The net effect of this is it creates huge reputational damage for South Africa as a conservation and tourist destination. As far back in as 2016, the IUCN World Conservation Congress issued a motion urging the government of South Africa to terminate the practice of breeding lions in captivity for the purpose of can shooting, and that that termination should be done through a structured time-bound process. And in the interim, uh, captive breeding of lions should be restricted to zoos or registered facilities whose documented mandate is a recognized registered conservation project. There have been repeated media calls dating back from 1997, globally being critical of South Africa's practices in this regard, starting with the Cook Report back in 1997, and then a plethora of books uh, and uh, at least three films. The latest one, Lions, Bones and Bullets, is still on the international circuit as we speak. And then there are ongoing reports of shipments of South African lion bone being intercepted in Vietnam and Laos, indicating that the trade in these uh, body parts is ongoing. This is obviously having a detriment to our economy. 
um, as it is contrary to the sustainable and responsible travel, uh, travel guidelines, for example, those published in South Africa by SATSA. And in doing so, it really undermines efforts to uh, rebuild South Africa's tourist industry after the uh, disruptions of COVID. What has South Africa been doing about ending this industry? I'm going to go through the timeline very quickly. If there are questions about that, we can come back to this later. But in 2018, there was a parliamentary portfolio committee colloquium in, uh, in August, which held uh, dealing specifically with captive lion breeding, which found that the following urgent interventions by the department were required that the department initiate a policy and legislative review of the breeding of lions for hunting and the lion bone trade with a view to ending this practice, that the department conduct an audit of captive lion breeding facilities and ensure that only facilities that currently comply with legislation are permitted, and that the department present a clear program of work on how uh, the department intends to address animal welfare and health for captive lions in the interim. Uh, and that job uh, straddles the two mandates of, of the mandates of two departments being environment and agriculture. And that that program of work again have clear timeframes for achieving those goals. I think most many people in this meeting will remember that those resolutions were then accepted by the National Assembly. In 2019, there was a judgment in the Gauteng High Court about the question of lion bone where the court held very clearly that the question of the welfare of animals in this trade must be considered in the permitting process, as that speaks specifically to our constitutional and legal obligations that arise from the environmental right in the Constitution and from the Biodiversity Act. In 2020, there were repeated calls on to the department to uh, implement these urgent interventions. Uh, a group of NGOs wrote to the minister and the department appealing for closure of the industry and the associated activities. The African lion conservation community also wrote to Minister Creasy urging an end to the industry. And over 115 tourism organizations called on the minister and the respective provincial nature conservation authorities to in effect end the industry in a structured way by declaring zero export quotas, a moratorium on breeding and no new permits. The high level panel report, which was released on the 2nd of May last year, was unequivocal in the majority view that the uh, captive lion breeding industry must be ended. The quote there is very clear. It says the ending of certain inhumane and irresponsible practices that greatly harm the reputation of South Africa and position South Africa as a leader in conservation is an imperative. More specifically, the captive lion industry poses a risk to the sustainability of wild lion conservation, resulting from the negative impact on ecotourism, which funds lion conservation and conservation more broadly. The high level panel recommended that South Africa does not breed captive lions, keep lions in captivity, or use captive lions or their derivatives commercially. And the Honorable Minister Creasy announced on the 2nd of May the vision for wildlife policy going forward, which included a secured, restored, and rewilded natural landscape. This uh, vision is entirely inconsistent with the keeping of large predators in captivity. So the five recommendations that the HLP panel included have not been fully implemented. As you can see from the slide, the minister was required to put in place policy decisions for the immediate halt of the sale of captive lion derivatives, the hunting of captive bred lions, and the ending of tourist interactions with captive lions. Whilst we don't have a quota uh, announced, that is in effect a zero quota, so there should be no export of lion bone, uh, but the media suggests and the interdiction of South African lion bone and other countries suggests very strongly that the lion uh, bone export is continuing. The high-level panel called for, called for an immediate moratorium on the issuing of permits for hunting captive lions, immediate end to the, immediately amend the conditions of existing permit holders to exclude activities such as tourist interactions, and the revision of permit stipulations to prevent new breeding and the sterilizations of lions to prevent further growth of the industry. 19 months after that report, we sit with precious little progress in implementing these goals. 
Frankly, four of the five goals have not been implemented in any transparent form. Captive line breeding continues at scale. We're not aware that any permits have been revoked or amended. There, no uh, administrative effect has been given to the court judgment regarding addressing animal welfare in these facilities and the illegal export of bones continues. The minister has set up a ministerial task team to identify and recommend voluntary exit options and pathways from the captive lion industry, but the terms of reference of that task team are extremely controversial. In section 2.4, it states that the, one of the functions of the task team is to develop agreed guidelines for ensuring lion welfare and well-being in any remaining captive lion facilities that do not take up the option of voluntary exit. That suggests very strongly that the department is not committed to ending the industry as a whole, and that is inconsistent with all the calls from the high-level panel and the draft policy position and all the international pressure to end this industry. We continue to have negative press um, about South Africa's trade. This uh, um, article on the right was released this month by the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, who tracked all the illegal activities that bedevil this industry um, right through from the horrific animal welfare conditions on the farms to the sale of lion bones into international markets. Recent studies by NGOs about what is happening on the ground indicate that there is a lack of standard operating procedures across these farms. The permitting system is convoluted, decentralized and not transparent. There are conflicting provincial regulations which result in legal loopholes. The provincial resources available are insufficient to provide adequate oversight of either the conservation or welfare implications of keeping large numbers of lions in captivity. In an in-depth look into the circumstances in the Free State Province, it was found that over 10% of the 5,000 microchips that are supposed to track the location of lions kept in captivity uh, could not be followed up, and 200 microchip numbers have been reused um, on animals either in captivity, euthanasia, or on transport permits, rendering the oversight of the industry to be entirely ineffective. So obviously ending the industry will have some impact. On the right of the slide there, we identify what the issues are. There would be some loss of employment. There would um, be an economic impact to the owners of the business. And of course, the fate of the lions is uns unsure since most of them cannot be placed in sanctuary and would probably have to face euthanasia. However, research into these issues shows that the um, number of jobs and uh, indeed the economic impact on the business of continuing the industry is far smaller than the actual costs that materialize um, to South Africa by way of the negative impact on ecotourism. Ross Harvey's paper in specifically uh, lists a body of peer reviewed evidence to support this saying that 80% of the income from captive bred lion hunting goes to the breeder and not into conservation. And um, that the number of jobs that would be lost through the industry would be made up by, uh, in a multiple, um, by, by and ecotourism alternatives that would flow from a result of South Africa restoring its reputation as a uh, authentic and um, genuine conservation destination. Although the industry currently generates gross revenues of approximately $180 million a year, that amounts to less than 1% of South Africa's tourism GDP. And an alternative land use could generate up to 960 jobs, which would be double what the lion breeding industry uses. The reputational damage to this industry over the next decade has been quantified at $2.8 billion. Um, and that impact would be felt largely through other parts of the conservation uh, and tourism economies. As a result of that, the, these calls to end captive breeding of lion remain even more pressing. We would also, of course, deal with the question of zoonotic diseases, which is a real and present threat. And we would reposition South Africa as a leader in wildlife conservation, consistent with the vision espoused in the HLP document. 
As a result, <clears throat> uh, we would like to respectfully, uh, but urgently urge this committee and the department to proceed with the immediate actions in the HLP and implement them without further delay. We ask also that, that, that those protections be applied not just to lions, but to all big cats in captivity, as uh, if we were to phase our captive lion breeding, but simply replace the lions with tigers or another large cat, we are simply moving the deck chairs around on the Titanic and the problems will remain. We're concerned that the relationship between the Departments of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development and the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment have not matured to the point where the question of the welfare of wild animals can be assured. And this is, requires uh, Im immediate work in order to uh, address this uh, persistent issue on the ground. The NSPCA has advised they've done over 100 inspections of captive lion breeding facilities this year and the welfare problems indicated previously persist and there has been no improvement in the average standard of welfare for animals in the industry. We ask also that the Minister of Environment request the Minister of Agriculture to regulate the industry in terms of Section 10 of the Animals Protection Act to prevent the suffering of animals which would give effect to the lion bone judgment. And we're asking for uh, regulations, not guidelines, because the guidelines uh, we feel will be ineffective in managing uh, the welfare of this industry. We want uh, formal regulations in terms of NEMBA to prohibit these activities and give effect to the HLP report. Finally, uh, we would like this committee to please consider the Animal Welfare Colloquium, which would allow the NGO sector to contribute to this process and make uh, uh, positive input into supporting both this, this portfolio committee and the agriculture one in order to move these matters forward. Finally, in closing, I'm just going to show this short video. Um, it's only about a minute long, but it shows how the hunting of these lions works in practice. Um, in one case, a lioness is shot while sitting in a tree in an act of barbaric cruelty. She is then shot on the ground a further nine times in seven minutes. That unfortunately is the face of South Africa's conservation and lion bone industry that the international community is seeing at the moment. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address, address this committee and I welcome any questions. Tony, can I check if that is the, um, the end of the presentation? You had said something about 15 minutes. Um, yes, Honorable Chair, that is the end of the presentation. Thank you. Wonderful. Honorable members, it is my pleasure to invite you to engage the briefing by the conservation action. I see the hand of uh, Honorable Bryant, the hand of Honorable Paulson, the hand of Honorable Mbata, and the hand of Honorable Singh. In that order. Thanks very much, um, Chairperson, and and thank you to Tony for that presentation, which was um, very uh, enlightening, but at the same time quite difficult to to also watch, especially you know some of those visuals that have come through. Just a couple of questions uh, for Tony. The first one is, do you think that we should have an option um, of a kind of voluntary exit for the captive lion breeders, almost like an amnesty uh, in place? Um, also, you know, we have asked on previous occasions, um, I know the DA in particular, we've called for the lion breeding or the, the lion task team um, that's supposed to be established uh, to ensure that it's inclusive, that it uh, includes people from all sectors, including the, the lion industry itself, um, but also veterinarians, uh, specialists, members of the NGO sector, etc. Do you have any feedback as to how far along 
um, the establishment of that task team is, um, and yeah. whether or not you and other industry role players have been consulted um, in terms of that uh, yet. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Chairperson, sorry. Honorable Sir? Yeah, Chairperson, yeah. sorry to come in uh, like this. Chairperson, I was just wondering whether or not we should get the department to respond to the issues like the audit, et cetera. So when we have that, we can have a fuller discussion with, with both the, the CAT and, and the department on what's not done. Because I don't know if it's fair to our CAT, you know, what's happening with the task team, et cetera. It, it's just a suggestion that we can have a fuller picture on, on, on these issues. If it's not accepted, that's fine. We can continue. Thank you. Um, is that your question or to... Or no, no, it's a question? proposal. It's a proposal. Yeah, yeah. But, yes, but what I'm checking, Honorable Singh, is does it relate also to the presentation or you still want an opportunity to the presentation? No, no, I, I thought we should still ask the presenter questions, but get the department to respond to some of the issues that were raised in the presentation so that we have a full understanding of how far has the department gone in implementing what the high level panel had recommended, what are the challenges, et cetera, and then try and find each other on how we move forward as a collective uh, towards the same goal. I'm with you. I, I think the DG will, will be given an opportunity to respond to the Conservation Action Trust presentation, uh, whether things are continuing as usual in terms of the captive lion breeding or not. Uh, but for now, let's just take the hands that we had noted that relates to uh, the presentation, if that is uh, agreeable. All right, thank you. So I'll answer Honorable Brian's questions then, if that's okay. Um, okay, be, be, before before that, uh, Tony, we still have um, Honorable Paulson and Honorable Mbata. Uh, I'm sure Honorable Singh will also want to come back perhaps for questions on the presentation. And then at the later stage, we'll invite the department to also give uh, clarity on some of the concerns that might also be raised from the point of view of Honorable Members. Uh, Honorable Paulson. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, and thank you very much, Tony, for your presentation. Tony, I'd, I'd just like to get a sense. Is the organization opposing canned lion hunting, or are you opposing all lion hunting? And that's the first question. And the next question is, should we not then ban hunting of our wildlife? Completely, wildlife. Uh, you know that these are these are public resources, and uh, I, I just shudder to think that anyone can think that they have the right to keep wildlife and have it hunted at all. So what do your feeling be about the ban, complete ban on the hunting of wildlife. Thank you very much, Jefferson. Recording you, in progress. Uh, Honorable Mbata. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just want to uh, to express my dissatisfaction on the issue. We started it with uh, the late Honorable um, Paul, and I thought by now we will be getting a, pro a, 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 a progressive feedback on a lion or, or captive lion hunting. And I, I can see that we haven't moved even an inch. We still stuck. But I want to ask uh, 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 Mr. Tony to say how best, because when you come in to report to us, you want the portfolio committee to assist us. How do you see us as the portfolio committee assisting you in um, uh, firstly the, uh, stopping the exportation 
of a lion carcass is through the over tambo because I feel that it's illegal. There is a, a, a legislation that must be followed when you, you export, especially such a carcasses uh, outside to the to other countries. And also on the issue of the high panel, uh, high level panel, because I thought that the high level panel by this time have implemented, all, um, I mean, the department have implemented all the um, recommendations from the high level panel. Uh, how do you see us as the portfolio committee? Because most of the questions that I have will be directed to the department who has failed us, according to myself. How do you see us uh, assisting you in order to see that all those um, high level panel um, recommendations are implemented? And also, as we have recommended that they also be presented or to the uh, National Assembly, because most of the questions that I have are related to the department, but I want you to tell us how, how, how best do you see us as the portfolio committee assisting you in all this mess what, uh, on what you have presented now. And I'm, I'm so disappointed because I thought by now we would have moved a, 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 a lot on this issue, especially after the appointment of a high level panel. But it's disappointing that uh, most of their recommendations were not uh, implemented. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable uh, Chairperson. Uh, Chairperson, I just want to share the disappointment that Honorable Mbata and our other colleagues uh, have been expressing as well. You know, I've been long on this portfolio committee to know that these issues that are being raised are issues that have been raised ad nauseum. And then we get grandiose statements about what is going to be done. We set up panels, panels come up with recommendations, and we fail hopelessly in terms of implementation. And I think we've heard that today, uh, <clears throat> that, that we failed on the implementation side. Now, now uh, Tony, thank you for your presentation again. Uh, you did mention, uh, you did indicate in your presentation that as far as you know, there are 366 registered captive lion breeding facilities in terms of NEMBA, and these have licenses. Uh, are you aware of any audits that are carried out by the department from, from, from your knowledge on what happens on the ground? Uh, is there any monitoring by the department and how often? And I think I will ask the same question of the department as well. And then you did indicate also in your presentation that only one out of the five recommendations, the five or six from the high level panel have been implemented. Have you all been briefed or informed uh, in, in the last year or so why these challenges uh, exist and uh, for how long they will continue to exist from the side of being a conservation body? And again, Chairperson, I'll ask the department uh, the very same question. But I think enough is enough on this matter. Uh, we really cannot allow this, uh, you know, the non-implementation of the recommendations to continue uh, in this fashion. And I think as a portfolio committee, we've even got a resolution of the National Assembly, which is binding on all of us. And we're not even respecting those resolutions. So, so something has to be done and it's done seriously. And I think we have to put a, a very strict time frame on the side of implementation. And like I said earlier on, it's unfortunate that uh, none of the political uh, uh, functionaries, being the minister or the deputy minister, are with us uh, to be able to answer these political questions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable uh, C. Um, before I invite you to respond, uh, Tony, um, and um, immediately after yourself, we will invite the DG and the department to also speak to these issues. Now, the, in, in, our pre, in our previous engagements, you had raised concerns about 
the the exposure of of some of the workers, especially those who process these lion bones for for trade uh, uh, um, uh, to lion related uh, tuberculosis and other illnesses, uh, is that still a concern? And if so, how many people have been affected? If if you have such such statistics, uh, and perhaps from from the point of view of of the of the of the DG and the department, we 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 know and 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 we understand that uh, some 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 things about the captive lion breedings, uh, uh, but we are not out there in the field uh, as 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 you are. Um, the same as the conservation action is. Uh, so your perceptions and probably uh, your perspectives are very important uh, and they do matter to us. Now, uh, as an important uh, uh, conservation stakeholder, I'd like to know whether the conservation action has noticed uh, any move against these harmful practices from the side of the department since the adoption of the, uh, the National Assembly Resolution, Assembly Resolution, um, I think in, in November uh, 2018. But from a point of view of the department, uh, has there been any action uh, in relation to the implementation of the National Assembly uh, Resolution? Um, uh, you would you, agree that uh, this uh, links completely with what Honorable Singh has just uh, said. Can, can I can I invite uh, uh, Tony first to respond, and then the GG or anybody in the department to assist us in terms of <clears throat> what has been what has been asked here by honourable members. Uh, Tony, uh, thank you, uh, Chair, and <clears throat> thank you for all these um, I think insightful questions. <clears throat> I'll try to go through them in the order they were asked. So, honourable Brian's question about the voluntary exit uh, <clears throat> that seems to be a core tenant of the department's strategy at this point. I think obviously there are um, in the region of four or 500 jobs that are at stake. And so any exit from the industry or any exit from this industry needs to consider the harms that will befall people who are currently employed in the industry. And so a voluntary exit may seem to give a negotiated pathway for um, businesses to transition from uh, this captive line breeding industry to something that is less harmful both to the country as a whole, to the animals and to the workers. It should be noted though that the welfare community has on two separate occasions proposed to the department um, working plans to end the industry, first when there were only 3,000 lines and then again in 2020. And so the scale of the problem continues to increase and therefore the costs and difficulty with ending the industry promptly continue to magnify. So we think a voluntary exit is a useful tool in order to facilitate um, <clears throat> the closure of the industry. There are some of the smaller farms that may only be marginally profitable and they might be willing to take up a voluntary exit. Ultimately, we think uh, alone a voluntary exit is not going to be enough because some of these businesses are well established, have large infrastructure, large numbers of animals, and without um, some form of compulsion are likely to unlikely to surrender those businesses. Of course, the difficulty arises that some of these businesses have been correctly permitted by provincial government. And so that's why the uh, implementation mechanism that the colloquium and the high level panel identified was first to put a cap on the permitting and to do the audit and the census in order to establish to what extent these businesses are operating legally and to what extent they are not correctly permitted. Obviously, it would be improper for the government to, or any other stakeholder to fund a voluntary exit for businesses that are not operating in accordance with the law. So this, I understand, is going to be the work of the task team um, and the task team um, to uh, uh, answer one of the other questions is, uh, we understand is due to be announced soon. We know a few people who've been contacted about it, but it has been 19 months since the high level panel report uh, said that these urgent inter interventions must happen. And indeed, this is only one of the five urgent interventions, the other four all being related to putting a cap on the growth of the industry so as to not further complicate the exit trajectory. And um, 
without the census of the animals, the welfare audits, and the moratorium on new facilities and new animals, and indeed without the moratorium on breeding, this problem is just going to continue to escalate, which is what we believe has been happening uh, since the high-level panel report was produced. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, I'm going to come to um, Honorable Paulson's question at the end, because some of the other questions relate a bit more to what I'm saying. So our concern is not that the policy framework is we think the policy framework is appropriate. That that was said now, with the exception of that clause 2.4, which I read, which seems to be uh, confusing the issue and contemplating that some of the businesses will be allowed to continue. So it is our view. To the, min the minister and the department. Yeah, I don't know if it's just you, that but that clause the Chinese breaking fine. up quite a lot. Oh, sorry. Um, how, can you hear me better now? Yeah, yes. I, I, yeah, just proceed. Let's see how far you can go, Tony. Oh, sorry about that. So, um, I, in briefly, I was saying we think the policy framework is good, with the exception of the one term of reference for the task team, which creates ambiguity about whether the department has a clear commitment to end this industry entirely. So we think what needs to be done, and perhaps where the portfolio committee and the department can work together, is that those recommendations in my presentation simply need to be implemented with a much higher degree of urgency. Um, it's really slow progress, 19 months, and we don't even have an accurate census, and there's been no communication to the industry about stopping breeding. And as a result, the scale of the problem continues to magnify. There are some complexities in implementing this. We're mindful of that. There is this uh, ongoing confusion about who bears the welfare mandate between the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Environment, but that is addressed in that policy framework. And so um, we think that that requires some bilateral discussion and indeed the welfare community and, and the conservation groups are, are, are willing also to play their part in that role. Um, to answer uh, Honourable Singh's questions, we're not aware that any audits have been conducted, despite the high-level panel requiring that that be done urgently. And indeed, we're concerned from the information that the NSPCA shared that um, many of the facilities are not in full permit compliance and indeed continue to breed these animals and kill them for exports, which would be inconsistent with a good faith understanding that this industry is to be ended. We're not aware of any type of systematic monitoring of the industry outside of the work that the NSPCA does. And if they were only able, no disrespect to them, but they were only able to practically visit 100 of these facilities in a year, you can see that they're not covering the entire industry at all, and they have substantial difficulty getting access onto these premises. So I think we have to answer Honorable Singh's question by saying the audit and monitoring framework remi remains entirely inadequate. I think the lack of implementation arises from the complexity of ending an industry that has been substantially permitted by provincial government in the in the past. And so, what we ask is that those permits be uh, that the permits, no new permits, be issued, and that the current permits be enforced. And that would at least allow then an, a natural sunsetting of the industry and no future future growth. I think um, to answer. Um, Honorable Medici's question, um, the four, four or 500 people who are employed by the industry are often really low um, minimum wage workers who face substantial hardships in the job. There are from time to time reports in the media of people who have been injured or indeed in one or two cases were killed on these farms. Um, we should remember that these are wild animals and they are carnivores and uh, they are very unforgiving of mistakes. And so this really is very low class um, work that is, to my knowledge, not well regulated and the rights of these workers are not well protected. So Four Paws did the report, which I did have in my presentation, which deals with this more extensively, but we haven't seen any evidence that the Department of Labor or any other body has acted to protect workers in this context. And that, of course, 
leads to the conclusion that they may still be subject to systemic discrimination as um, as wage laborers, and that obviously also needs to be addressed. <clears throat> to answer Honorable Paulson's question um, uh, about <clears throat> whether we should be allowing any hunting of, of, of wild animals at all, in the context of captive lion breeding, there is broad consensus that this type of hunting is morally and practically unacceptable. From the video I showed, you can see um, there isn't even a semblance of fair chase um, and the lions are totally vulnerable, no possibility of an escape. And even um, <clears throat> many hunting organizations have viewed that type of practice with distaste. Relative to the question about hunting South Africa's wildlife more generally, we do have a robust mechanism in law to uh, manage the hunting of, especially of threatened or protected species. There are regulations that have been passed under the Biodiversity Act. And to the extent that those regulations are well implemented, there is a framework there. And I would suggest we don't confuse the question of ending the captive lion breeding industry with the broader question of whether animals, wild animals are in fact held for the interests of the nation as a whole, or whether they are in fact private property of the landowner. And I would be very pleased to have this discussion in a separate meeting with this committee or with Honorable Paulson as, as required, but our ask at this question is not to muddy the waters with the broader question of whether we should be hunting all these different types of uh, threatened or protected species at all, but to deal with the broad consensus that captive lion breeding and the canned hunting that is associated with that must be ended. I think my last, just to close then, um, to answer uh, Honorable Mabata's questions, what can this committee do? I think the first thing to do is to engage with the department and to engage with the welfare sector. So thank you for, and the conservation sector, thank you for the opportunity today. This is a good step to re-raise this issue and to try and assist with the unblocking the, the impediments to implementing those resolutions promptly. So those would involve um, having a closer working relationship with the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development who bear the legislative welfare mandate. But also, perhaps this committee, I might respectfully suggest, could ask the department to commit to the timeframes that were in the high level panel report and in the draft policy position, um, and that the task team the minister has established now to facilitate the ending of this industry does not have an open ended mandate, but indeed has some very finite timeframes stipulated in order to finalize the mechanism and indeed the implementation of the phase out. Thanks, Honorable Chair. I hope I've covered everything there that was asked of me. DG. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair, and uh, thanks uh, very much also to uh, Tony Gerrans for the presentation that he has made. Um, I, I think uh, what I would want to also propose, Chair, I think there's, there's a, a lot of issues that uh, have been uh, put uh, uh, forward uh, by the presenter. And, and I think maybe as a department, um, we need then also, I'm proposing that we also be given an opportunity to cover comprehensively around these matters uh, so that we can adequately uh, brief, brief the committee. We are going to respond. I have with me uh, the uh, DDGs. Uh, we are going to respond to the um, uh, best uh, ability uh, but if then there are issues that are not necessarily responded to, I think then uh, that uh, presentation, comprehensive presentation from the department through the minister and the deputy minister is what I would, I would put forward. I would want to, to uh, confirm the commitment of the department um, and the commitment of the minister uh, in relation to the dealing with the um, lions held in captivity. Um, and also, also given the background history of the work that was done uh, by parliament, uh, which then minister took forward that work by establishing the high level panel 
who have come up with recommendations uh, as already highlighted and stipulated in the, in the presentation. Um, I'm, I must indicate, Chair, that yes, uh, progress has been made um, and Minister has highlighted uh, in terms of some of the um, um, elements of implementation of the high level panel uh, recommendation that she has taken. The department has prioritized the um, uh, taking forward the white paper uh, um, on conservation on biodiversity, uh, which then is going to be an overarching uh, policy position of government, uh, which will deal with uh, both conservation and indeed the issues of uh, sustainable use. Taking into account what uh, is very critical and of concern, which are the issues of duty of care of, of, of animals and also issues of well being. Um, you know, the, the other aspect is also around welfare, and, and, and welfare, as already highlighted uh, um, in the presentation, is indeed a prerogative uh, mandate. Uh, is a mandate of uh, it's a mandate of of, of Dalrat, and Dalrat are working together with us uh, in terms of dealing with those welfare welfare issues. We do have an, a memorandum of understanding uh, with the department, and we have worked out an implementation plan uh, with the department in terms of how then do we take forward the issues of of of, of welfare. I wanted just to, before I ask the DDGs also to, to, to add, is that yes, indeed, the minister as uh, 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 committed in parliament has established the panel, the LIME panel, um, um, to look into the, the issues around the voluntary, um, uh, issues of uh, voluntary, uh, uh, dealing with the issues of um, lions in, in, in captivity uh, and, and, also ensuring, and also ensuring that all those elements of the high level panel recommendation are implemented. Implemented because uh, of the complexity of the issues uh, around the industry of lion uh, uh, captivity. Um, whereby um, we, we need to ensure that we safeguard uh, those jobs and come up with other alternatives. And we, we do agree that uh, voluntary is not necessarily going to be the only solution. There is a need and there may be a need to look into how best then uh, we deal with the others that are well established which is quite big business and uh, we would then have to come up with then the models on how to deal with that. There are certain plans that have been presented to the minister and minister is going to be sharing that with the panel for the panel to assist her in terms of then implementing, uh, the, um, uh, implementing the best uh, possible uh, solution, which will not necessarily leave uh, some of those that have actually benefited in terms of jobs, but also those that were having this industry uh, losing a lot of money that they would have invested. Uh, but we are in agreement that this has brought the country into, into, into disrepute. And we are then fast tracking and ensuring that these <clears throat> issues are dealt with um, through firstly, the policy paper, which is now has gone through consultation. It is now going to go through the cabinet processes and minister is hoping that we can finalize that before the end of the financial year. And in parallel, then the panel will then look into advising her on a number of uh, uh, aspects, especially key is on implementing the high level panel recommendation. I'm going to ask uh, acting DDG uh, uh, regulatory compliance, uh, Ms. Frances Craig, just to comment on some of the matters that were raised here. And also the DDG of uh, biodiversity and conservation to also comment uh, on some of the issues that would have been uh, raised and um, the members have requested clarity uh, in relation to this matter. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. 
Thank you. DDG. Um, th thank you very much, Chair and Honourable Members. Um, let me try and speak a little bit to the question from Honourable Singh around um, the audits. So, um, obviously, following the high-level panel recommendations, there's been a lot of discussion within <laughs> our different working groups that deal with compliance and enforcement around <laughs> how to deal with these aspects. Um, there have been audits uh, for example, within the Free State, obviously those have been led or driven by the Free State Department due to the competence, and they've done a lot of work in terms of those inspections together with the NSPCA. Um, the other thing that we've been working on, and it has been really important for us to align that to the task team that the Minister has um, set up for this issue, is to really look at how do we um, come up with a timetable and a compliance and enforcement strategy aligned to the work of the task team um, in order to ensure that, you know, we're not kind of working, um, you know, in contradiction uh, to what the task team's work is happening. So, for example, uh, we had our EMI Lachotla that happened now in November, which was around the 14th of November, and we had a whole day where we actually focused in on the line industry in order to talk about what it is that we need to do from a compliance and enforcement perspective. Uh, Four Paws was actually invited to that Lohotla. Unfortunately, they couldn't make it, but all the provincial authorities were there. And so we began um, developing the timetable and, and talking about the aspects around the compliance and enforcement strategy that we need to develop. Um, simultaneously to that, there is a lot of um, work happening, um, you know, concurrently in terms of enforcement. Uh, there's a lot of work we're doing with the CIT Secretariat at the moment. Um, a few of the facilities were identified uh, specifically um, with TIGERS. And so there's been uh, visits to some of those facilities and we'll continue to work with the CIT Secretariat on those facilities. And then in addition to that, there's um, quite a lot of work also happening in the background um, around enforcement related matters. So in 2021, there was a search and seizure at a particular um, house. Um, and there, obviously, there were arrests that took place. In addition, we were working with the Vietnamese authorities when that consignment in July last year was seized. Um, so there is a lot of work happening in the background. Um, and as the DG said, we can um, give the committee um, a bit more of a comprehensive feedback in terms of that work. But it is also important just to understand um, you know, that our, our enforcement strategy needs to be aligned to the work of the task team. And so, um, you know, we will obviously be, as soon as that task team is set up and start speaking, we will then go and present to them on, on our plans. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Chair, if I can come in. Chair, I... I just want to put forward that we will be very much interested in the report that is being referred to by the presenter so that we can also analyze it and be able to um, provide some of the answers to this. But further to confirm as the DG indicated that the task team for voluntary exit is likely to start its work before the end of this year as uh, per establishment of the minister. I also need to indicate further, Chair, that I'm noting that the presenter is referring to a number of non-compliance issues in terms of the Animal Protection Act. And uh, would urge that uh, probably this presentation might also ma could benefit from being shared with the Portfolio uh, Committee of Agriculture, otherwise, the department itself, because non-compliance in terms of the AP, AP, Animal Protection Act is a mandate of the uh, Department of Agriculture, uh, Land Reform and Rural Development. Thirdly, Chair, I just need to indicate that in terms of uh, where we are as a sector, we are not aware of any canned lion hunting taking place. And if indeed it is taking place elsewhere in the country, it is a, on an illegal basis. It's an illegal activity. Uh, and if there are recent, any recent incidences, if I were to say so, uh, that uh, a Conservation Action Trust is aware of, 
we would welcome between ourselves and our colleagues in uh, uh, regulatory control. We would welcome that um, uh, information to be made available. But as far as we are aware, Ken Lyon is not allowed in South Africa in terms of any legislation that we administer as a department. Further Chair, let me just share with you some of the numbers. So in terms of facilities that we have, we have 336, 366 facilities. These are captive land breeding facilities with approximately 7,979 lions. So though, those are the numbers that we are talking about in terms of if this industry was to close down tomorrow, we're talking about those facilities being affected. But further to indicate for wild lion populations, we have about 2,256. And that we do have limitations in terms of habitat management. And I just need to emphasize that there is no interbreeding, interbreeding or mix or otherwise from can lion, I mean, uh, captive breeding lions to wild lions facilities. There is no mixing that is taking place. So there is no direct uh, impact. And we have not seen any impact whatsoever of poaching uh, or, or any, uh, any cases whatsoever of poaching of wild lion uh, populations. So I just thought, Chair, let me put those uh, issues forward so that the committee can be aware of the work that we are doing, but also to indicate further that we are we are also updating the Lion Biodiversity Management Plan and uh, for um, um, as it is due for, for updating, and that is in respect of wild lions. I just need to emphasize that. Um, and further to that, as DG indicated, once we have completed the white paper process, which outlines uh, our approach in respect of animal well being and duty of care, we should then be able to proceed with a policy position regarding lions. We are working very closely with Dalrand. Any matter that any um, welfare organization shares with us, like in this particular case or otherwise with NSPCA, we are able to escalate some of the matters to Dalrand. And, uh, uh, and, and these organizations and um, these stakeholders are also open to also engage Dalrand uh, um, Dalrad uh, directly, especially in respect of uh, animal welfare related matters. Uh, as the committee may be aware, and I think this was a presentation we received in the last meeting, the committee re uh, received in the last meeting, Dalrad is also in the process of uh, amending the Animal Protection Act to close some of the loops that may exist to the extent that animal welfare is concerned and they will be consulting with uh, us as DFFE in respect of that amendment process that they will be engaged in. I, however, do support uh, the DG and my colleagues view that we, if we are give, we, we, if given an opportunity to bring a comprehensive presentation to the committee, we will be able to provide the committee with a more comprehensive response of uh, what we are doing um, around uh, the lions uh, both uh, in captive brain facilities and also in wild, uh, wild populations um, also. So that will then help to respond to the issues. We will also be interested to get an indication of how old the footage that the committee is being exposed is, um, because as far as we are aware, management authorities have not, or issuing authorities have not issued any permits uh, since uh, around 2017, 2018. Any new, there hasn't been any opening of new facilities. Um, and therefore we'd like to know where these, uh, if there are instances uh, that um, the presenter is aware of, we will welcome that information to be made available also. I'm not sure if Francis did indicate that the next compliance and enforcement program is due to take place in 2020-2023. Uh, this will be a joint compliance and enforcement program that is undertaken between us as DFFE and um, the uh, management authorities uh, also 
uh, together with uh, Dalrand and uh, NSPCA so that we can deal with non-compliance issues in terms of both the Animal Protection Act and also in terms of uh, NEMBA also. Thank you very much. Uh, we will then look, look forward to providing a more comprehensive update to the committee uh, when invited to do so. Thank you. Honorable <clears throat> members, can I check if there are follow up uh, questions? Um, uh, Honorable Paulson, Honorable Bryant, Honorable Mbata, and Honorable C. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chairperson. Chairperson, I'm, uh, I'm just really concerned that uh, the DM said that they are unaware of any canned lion breeding hunting taking place. And yet we see they received a presentation saying that it is. And that to me raises alarm bells that there's something that is happening and the minister says they are unaware of it. And nothing is being done about this illegal activity then. So I think if Tony can provide us with, with um, more information about those facilities that are um, breeding lions in captivity for the purpose of hunting, that he should then uh, provide that to the department and something should be done about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Paulson. Honorable Bryant. Thanks, Chair. Um, I just want to say first up, I'm, I'm incredibly disappointed um, at the response from the department. Um, it's not as if they didn't know this presentation was taking place. Uh, neither the minister nor the deputy minister are present. We've established that. But it just appears as if the officials are completely unprepared to, to answer any of the questions that have been that have been put forward. And to have the same response, you know, that, that we'll come back to you at a later stage with some answers. No, that's not what a portfolio committee is about. We're supposed to be asking questions and receiving responses during the meeting. Otherwise, what's the point of having meetings? We might as well just submit written questions. Um, so I'm just very disappointed. It doesn't, doesn't appear as if the department or the ministry is actually taking this seriously. Um, and and uh, I feel like Mr. Gerens, who's come and put this presentation together, and us as, as members are, are effectively being fobbed off, and I just don't think it's good enough. Um, in terms of the white paper uh, that was mentioned, it's, yes, it's an important piece of legislation, very important piece of legislation, but that doesn't mean that other steps can't be taken in the interim, and we have mentioned some of those and established some of those. Um, I just want to ask now, um, how many members um, have been selected as part of that task team? Um, Mr. Gerens has mentioned that some of his colleagues have been uh, uh, contacted already. And uh, I understand that there were about 40 CVs that were received. This was in response to a question that I submitted to the minister. Um, but we've also heard that, um, uh, that there's no set date yet for the first meeting uh, of the task team. Uh, it, are the officials aware of when that first uh, meeting will take place? The reason I ask is that the minister has also responded to me to say that uh, the work of this task team uh, will be concluded by the 31st of March. Now, if we haven't had a meeting yet, uh, if that information hasn't been sent out, we're about to, to go into a constitu uh, constituency recess period and then a full recess period and probably only come back at the beginning of February. Uh, that means that the task team will have less than a month um, during parliamentary time, at least, uh, to conclude their work. So what are the actual timeframes around this? Um, I also think that we should allow um, the Wildlife Ranching Association of South Africa to come and present to us, and we should request that they do so, so we can get some facts firsthand as well in terms of what is taking place um, with lion breeding and, and canned hunting. And, uh, you know, also just in terms of, uh, and I agree with Honorable Paulson wholeheartedly here, Canned hunting, and I've got a definition here, canned hunt is a trophy hunt which is not a fair chase, typically by having game animals kept in a confined area, such as a fenced ranch, to prevent them from
from escaping and make the tracking easier for the hunter to increase the likelihood of the hunter obtaining a kill. Now, we all watched that video, which I believe was taken around 2019, 2020, of a lion in a tree. It looks like in a back garden, effectively, being shot 10 times. That, for me, is a canned hunt. So I, I'm very confused as to the comments to say that there's no canned hunting taking place. Unless that video was shot somewhere else um, in a different country, um, but it doesn't seem like it. From what I understand, that it was taken in South Africa. Um, so that's I find very strange. Um, so yeah, and then the last one is just in terms of the animal welfare legislation. We were for many uh, uh, meetings asking uh, about that joint meeting between. Dallard and uh, and DFFE. I know that that uh, Dallard or Dalrad, however you pronounce it, was uh, supposed to be taking the lead on that. Um, I would just strongly urge that we get that up and running by uh, the 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 next quarter, uh, the first quarter of next year, uh, so that we can really interrogate that legislation and the information and progress that's taking place. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honourable Brian, Honourable Mbata. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairperson. I'm, I thought the department was going to tell us on the, some issues that were ra also raised by the presenter, Mr. Tony, on the issue of the, the abattoirs. I know it's being done, but the, it's, it falls under the Department of Agriculture, but uh, maybe they should have said something about it. And also the zoonotic diseases. Um, but they, they didn't say anything. Remember, even last time, during the previous presentations on the captive captive uh, lion breeding, it was said that the the meat after it has the, this uh, lions have been shot, then uh, they take the meat and they donate it to the nearby communities. And which also talks on the issue of abattoir and the issue of zoonotic diseases and other diseases. I'm not surprised when uh, people who are working with this, um, um, the, the bones of the carcasses uh, sometimes get tuberculosis because we've got um, uh, 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 some uh, uh, diseases that you get from from the uh, and animals, whether they whether it's wild animals or the the cattle or the sheep or the goats, there are those. One of them is to is TB, and uh, other other diseases. And I don't see the department mentioning anything about that, and uh, that makes me worried. And uh, how they respond, it's like they didn't know that they. There's this thing, there's, there's this uh, uh, presentation that they need to respond to. Um, I'm also not sure and uh, very much disturbed on the, when uh, the, the second DDG says there's a joint compliance program that will be uh, conducted in 20, 2022. I don't know, I'm not sure about the dates. It triggers my memory to say, um, for such cases, there must be a continuous uh, and uh, un, uh, un, un, unannounced uh, 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 compliance programs, uh, 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 audits that must be done. And in case of such things, there must be, there must, there must not be a gap, but there must be short, uh, uh, short terms so that they, they monitor what is happening. But if they give such a long, long term to, to, to go back, if to do another audit or compliance program uh, uh, audit, it becomes a problem. And uh, I will also request that, uh, I'm, I'm happy um, uh, Honorable uh, Dave has, has mentioned that, but it's not only Department of Agriculture, I'll also request the Department of Labor, which deals with uh, labor issues and also occupational health and safety issues. I'll also request the uh, SAC, uh, 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 
the ones that deals with animals, SACPSA, S A C P S A, if I'm not mistaken. And then the, the, the other department that we can't leave out that deals with the health issues is the Department of Health, but specifically the epidemiological disease department. Because we're dealing, we'll be dealing here with epidemiological diseases because they would they must tell us what are they doing as the department because I believe this is this issue it doesn't only affect the two departments but also labor and department of health and the ones that deals with the the the, the animals. So let's get all those departments to come in one one under one meeting and uh, present to us so that we get the clarity of of what is happening because now uh, this department will say we are doing this with this other department but they are not here and we don't have a presentation so that we close the gap and finalize these issues. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Mbata. Honorable Sin. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. Yeah, Honorable Chairperson, uh, just to take up what the, uh, the I think the DDG said, uh, uh, perhaps we as a committee need to flag in our first meeting of next year, a comprehensive report back uh, from the department on this matter. So it's still on the radar. But in the meanwhile, if there's any additional information that they want to provide us, then that can be sent to the committee. So we could read it over, you know, when, when, whenever we get that information, any 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 uh, updates. Secondly, I'd just like to know with these 366 registered captive lion breeding facilities, is there an association of some sort that they formed? Uh, or are they representatives that speak on their behalf? Because, you know, perhaps it's good to have the Audi Alterum Partum rule uh, prevail as well and hear their side of the story. Uh, in terms of what they do and what they not do as an association, if they are an association. And uh, yeah, so I think I'll, I'll just stop at that. But just to say that we need to give this matter our fullest attention. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Singh. Honorable Mbata, is that a legacy hand? It's a legacy hand. Let me take it Okay. Down. Thank you very much. Before I invite you to respond, uh, Tony and the department, uh, I, I wholeheartedly agree with the, uh, the, the, the second taking of honorable members um, on the issues that they are raising in line with the responses that you had provided earlier. Uh, honorable Paulson requests that if there are illegal activities uh, or, or so-called canned lions, uh, additional information that you might have uh, as a trust. Please provide us with uh, such information. And uh, perhaps I must also lobby the committee that um, in the first quarter of our 2023 term, uh, we should infuse, try as much as possible to visit those areas um, also in line with what Honorable Mbata is raising, the Department of Rural Development, Agriculture um, and Land Reform, your labor and others. Uh, let's get that additional information. Perhaps let's go and see for ourselves. Uh, whilst I agree with what Honorable Singh is saying that uh, the principle of uh, hearing both sides of the story, um, uh, of the Alder and Parten, Let's hear what uh, these people think, if what they are doing is uh, wild uh, or captive. Uh, but let's also go and satisfy ourselves um, um, and wherever they might be operating. But that information is going to be very crucial uh, for us, uh, uh, Tony, and yourself, uh, the department. Uh, but we must be unequivocal also as a, as a committee uh, that uh, the recommendations of the high-level panel must be implemented. Uh, that white paper on conservation and sustainable use, the welfare and well-being, all of that must be implemented. We can't be talking and talking and talking and there's no implementation all the time. Um, but I, I also want us to have time frames, DG. Uh, when you say that um, uh, because the wisdom of the, uh, of the portfolio committee is that we must have a comprehensive uh, uh, presentation and responses. 
um, on on both the wild lions and the captive uh, and canned lions. We we would really love that, but oh, by when? Um, and I think it should be clear from here that we we want that as early as 2023 from the very beginning. Uh, that should also include the biodiversity management plan uh, that the DDG spoke about. Uh, the, we can't continuously be having conversation now and, until our term uh, ends and um, uh, uh, and there's nothing that is being done to that effect. Tony, take your last bite uh, in the next three minutes and the DG will have the last three minutes and then we close the subject part. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, and I thank you to all the committee for their, um, their good questions. We will be pleased. We'll put together a pack of the information that has been requested here and forwarded through for further consideration. So thank you for, for that opportunity. Uh, insofar as the relationship between Dalred and uh, the Department of Environment is concerned, um, we think that the lion bone judgment makes it very clear that whilst the legislative mandate for welfare in South Africa rests clearly with agriculture, the administrative mandate is shared across different departments and um, that judgment in our view holds that the Department of Environment and indeed other departments must consider animal welfare in policy and implementation. So we would be pleased for an opportunity to brief both this committee and Delrid together on this issue. And maybe in the future, that is something we have discussed. Uh, and maybe that's something we could uh, discussions and an MOU between the two departments. But our understanding is that that is at early stages and is certainly nowhere near getting near the level of maturity that would allow um, these issues to be dealt with functionally efficiently across both departments. I think the question of the white paper, um, we would be very, very disappointed if indeed any implementation on this captive lion breeding industry was made contingent on the finalization of that white paper. We know that it is being fast tracked, um, but as Honorable Brian said, it, that is national policy uh, dealing with the question of sustainable use and is a multifaceted examination of that institution of sustainable use. And I hope the information I've shared with this committee today shows that the captive breeding of lions is indeed not a sustainable use in any type of definition. It's simply an abuse of uh, some of the wildlife resources that this country holds. Um, in closing, I'd like to say thank you for the time today and for the robust discussion. And we look forward to the work that uh, has been undertaken here happening going forward. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. DG. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I will briefly just uh, respond uh, to Honorable Brian's questions around the task team, lion task team. Uh, yes, uh, Minister has been consulting, uh, contacting uh, individuals uh, following a process that we had uh, gone through as a department where the 40 uh, CVs were received. And we, the, the department is looking at about eight uh, members uh, to form part of the task team. And Minister has committed that uh, before the 14th of December, uh, the meeting, the first meeting will, will, will be there. And uh, she is then going to be uh, taking then the uh, panel and the task team through their key uh, responsibilities where then they need them to be assisting the minister uh, with uh, an intention of concluding within the timeframes that the minister uh, will have. Uh, can I request, uh, Chair, just uh, uh, briefly on, on the zoonotic uh, diseases that Member Mata has uh, raised, maybe uh, uh, DDG, uh, you can then be in a position to just respond briefly. Obviously, abattoirs are under um, a dull um, And then lastly, Chair, we are ready, as you have highlighted, uh, to come back comprehensively. Uh, beginning of the calendar year, in the last quarter of the financial year, uh, we will be ready to come back and uh, present, uh, depending on the time that will be given by the portfolio, by the portfolio committee. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much. Oh, I thought Chair was going to respond on the zoonotics. Sure. Sure, please proceed. 
and the meat. I, I just wanted to indicate that uh, matters related to animal diseases and meat are regulated by Dalrald also. So meat is regulated in terms of the Meat Safety Act. So any regulation in respect of abattoir is the responsibility of uh, Dalrald. So goes the same with uh, zoonotics that are also regulated in terms of uh, animal health by Dalrald uh, also. Thank you. Thank you, Chileka. Can you can can it can it be put on record that uh, we we can't be meeting with the TFFE and they tell us something belongs to Talrat? Uh, clearly, when we meet Talrat, they are going to tell us something belongs to the TFFE. Um, I know our program is already hectic as adopted, but uh, there must be a, a session where we meet both of them, and they must point each other with fingers and. Uh, and we must get solutions. Um, and that is how we get to the conclusion, uh, honorable members of this uh, subject matter. Thank you very much to all the presenters. Thank you very much to the department um, and uh, the Conservation uh, Trust, uh, Conservation Action for the presentation. We hope to see you in the future very soon so that we put this matter to its finality. With that being said, honorable members, can we then move to the next item? If we are agreed. Sorry, Chair, just one, one brief thing, if you allow me. Chair, just, sure, very, just very briefly, um, there was a proposal, I think it was myself, I think also, uh, Honorable Singh, and I think Honorable Paulson as well, to see if we could get a presentation from Wildlife Ranching South Africa uh, in the first quarter of next term. Um, they are the guys who deal with um, the ranching of, of wild animals and perhaps could provide some more context. Um, maybe we could include that uh, when we have the presentation uh, from the DFFE that um, they've committed to today. Um, I can provide the details of that organization if need be to uh, Tielega. Thanks, Chair. Certainly. I think that will be very helpful, uh, Honorable Bryant. Can we do that? Uh, please liaise with Chileka. Uh, all yes, other... no, Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. The, the, those items will be on the program for the next time. Thank you. Honorable members, that brings us to item number three of the agenda. Uh, the consideration and the adoption of the desirability. Uh, this is a procedural matter, um, a motion of desirability in line with Rule 86, subsection 4 of the National Assembly Rules, um, that after the due deliberations, the committee must consider a motion of, desir of desirability on the subject matter of the bill, and if rejected, uh, must immediately table the bill and its report. And if the motion is desirable and is adopted, we must then proceed. Um, this is in line with the, the, the National Field and Forest Fire Amendment Bill that was referred to us as a committee. And we have undertaken the public hearings from, the, from May to October. Then we have also seen the additional written submissions that we have received. Uh, we all know what the objectives of the bill were. Um, can I then get the adopter, the mover of the adoption of this motion? From there, we'll get the presentation if uh, the committee adopts the mover, if the adopt, if the committee adopts the motion. We're getting a mover, honorable members. Chair, uh, through you, can we request those who were most of the time uh, attending the oversight? Because last time, uh, honorable person, 
when I seconded, he said, I can't second. <laughs> I wanted to move, but I don't want to be abused by Honorable Paulson. <laughs> no, 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 no. Honorable Mbata, this is a totally different issue. This is the motion of desirability where you have every right to say, yes, we need this particular bill to be signed into law. No, but you usually don't don't uh, have. It, 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 it's fine. It's fine, honourable members. Let, uh, let, honorable me move, members. let me move for 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 adoption, chair. Thank you, honourable Mbata. That is what we wanted. Uh, there's a mover for the adoption of the motion of desirability. Can we get a seconder? I second the motion, chair. Thank you very much, Honorable Singh. The motion of desirability has been adopted. Can I then invite uh, the Department um, of mm -hmm. Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment of the proposed to take us through on the clause by clause of the proposed uh, uh, clauses on the National Field and Forest Fire Amendment Bill, given uh, the background that we had said that uh, the presentation that was made in one of the present uh, the portfolio committee um, did not highlight all the issues that we had interfaced with during the public consultation. Um, who is leading the charge, uh, DG? Thank you very much, uh, We have uh, Mr. Spusiso, who is the acting chief director, uh, Kobose who will then present uh, on behalf of the department on the clause by clause uh, deliberation uh, on the National Fell Fire Amendment Bill. I will immediately hand over to him to take the committee through. Thank you. Thank you, DG. Mr. Spusiso, please take the portfolio committee through on the National Felt and Forest Fire Amendment Bill clause by clause as requested. No, thank you, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members. And thank you, DG, as well, and the colleagues. Uh, good uh, morning. Um, I'm not sure if you can see my presentation. I've tried to share. We would like to see you first. Yes, I'm trying to open the... How do I open? Uh, it is setting. Why am I visible now, Chair? You are very clear. We can see you, Mkegas. Okay. No, thank you, Chair. So can you see the, the, the PDF document that I've shared? Yes, we can. Okay, no, thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, this is not a long document. I think it's about... Uh, 12 or 13 pages long. I'll try to run through the, 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 the clause by clause presentation for consideration for the committee. Uh, maybe by way of background, Chair, I think you've mentioned that we, we've, we've had the committee in the past two committee meetings. The department made uh, comprehensive responses to the public comment that were or public uh, representations that were made from the public the public participation process in the last meeting in particular uh, we then uh, came back and uh, provided additional responses uh, to the public uh, input received on the bill but notably there was also a presentation from the parliamentary legal advisor we then advise the committee on the process to be followed in taking the bill forward. But then I, I won't really dwell on that. I think she is more competent to advise on pro parliamentary processes. Safe to say that in, what I got that in that presentation is that the she was advising on the on how we should treat the kind of submissions or proposals that we received from the public participation process. Uh, from the presentation last, the last presentation, some some of the proposals can be characterized as, as quite substantive. 
some uh, were introducing new amendments into the bill. So uh, I think the advice was that those should then be looked at carefully uh, and uh, the committee must then decide how those should be treated. But in the end, I think the chair was clear to say this bill must be finalized as soon as possible. Any uh, substantive amendments that will have a potential of delay, delaying the bill, those can then be put in abeyance uh, or possibly catered for in the regulations, uh, if that is feasible, or in the next round of amendments. But uh, what I gathered was that the bill must be processed now and um, the, the, all, only the, the amendments that are capable of being included in the bill now should be included. So Chair, that's the reason I'm, I'm prefacing the, the, my presentation is because the column you see focuses on, on, the, on the amendments that will find, the, or that we propose must find their way into the bill. So those substantive amendments, for example, they were quite a uh, few substantive amendments, for example, around provi providing for enhanced penalties. If we were to include, we had made a proposal in the, in the last PC meeting to say, maybe the penalties in the bill must then be aligned to those in, NIM, in, in section 49B of, NEM, of, NEM, of NEMA, which are more substantive and more, and more stronger. For example, they make reference to 10 year imprisonment or 10 million or five, uh, five Five year imprisonment or, or 20 million. So that's what those are quite enhanced. So our proposal was that let's align with that. But to do that, it will mean that we are introducing new amendments into the bill. And there's a different process uh, that must be followed as advised by the parliamentary legal, legal advisor. There was a proposal around prescribing penalties in respect of, of appeals. But then we had advised in our response that timeframes, we, pro we proposed that timeframes should be catered for in the regulations because it's, it gets much easier to then uh, amend the regulations as and when that is necessary instead of factoring timeframes into, into the main act. The proposals around funding of FPAs, providing the necessary support, uh, especially to traditional leadership, but then we had responded to say, section seven of the act already is an empowering provision. Minister is enabled to make the necessary interventions and provide the support. The department is developing a, a support strategy. So most of those uh, support proposals will then be catered for, in, especially in that support strategy. There was a proposal on holding municipalities accountable uh, in terms of form joining or joining the FPAs and generally observing the provisions of the act. Uh, we had made a proposal, comprehensive proposal in the last presentation. But that kind of proposal was, I think, it, it should be viewed as being substantive and it will, it will be a new introduction into the bill. So Chair, I'm just, um, in summary, that's what, that's the nature of the discussions that happened last time. And all these substantive provisions won't find their way into the bill uh, in this uh, instance. So if I may then go into, into the table of uh, the clause by clause table, which is those proposals that should find their way into the bill. Uh, the first, uh, maybe if you look at the table, the first table, first column is just a, a description of the clause of the bill and the section that's been amended. Second uh, column is about the uh, the wording in the bill, the current wording in the bill it has been extracted verbatim as is. The third column is the input from the, uh, received from the public participation process that was conducted by parliament. The fourth, fourth column is the actual wording, the proposed wording. You will realize Jay, that in some instances, the public, will, the, the, the public will just make suggestions without providing the wording or the text but what we've done then, where there's been, we can clearly clean the intention. We then assist by making recommendations as a department in the last column to say, this is from the, the public input received. This is how we see this being factored into the bill. So we are proposing text in the last column from the 
department side as recommendations. So the, uh, the first few pages change just about the definitions, uh, the proposed amendments into the definitions of the amendment bill. The first one, uh, Chair, is uh, looking at the definition of communal land. Here, yeah, Chair, the, if you recall, the, in the very first committee briefing on this bill, the Chair back then, I think it was around February, March, raised the issue of incorrect referencing of certain legislation, including the Communal Land Rights Act. I think the chair really tried to hold us to account to say that act has been declared unconstitutional. Uh, she then questioned why we're still referencing it here. But then we then uh, considered on that point and said that is, is something that must be corrected. Uh, and uh, from the public participation process, that was also a recurring comment to say there's some improper, improperly referenced uh, legislation. So the, so the Proposal here is to then uh, correct the incorrect referencing of the communal land rights. We had a discussion with the state chief, office of the chief, chief state law advisor just to discuss how that in, in, incorrect references, in, incorrect referencing can be corrected. I think the best approach that we agreed on is that we need to delete this definition of communal land, especially because the wording communal land is only occurs once in the content of the bill. This is not used in many, in many instances. It only, you know, it, it only occurs once in clause two of the bill. So the we also consulted with Dalrat to check how far whether to confirm whether that act was indeed, indeed uh, declared invalid and what have they done. Delrat briefed us to uh, confirm that that act is unconstitutional and is, is of no force or effect, but they have now started a process of developing a new communal land bill. That bill, uh, although it's still at, at the early stages, but the bill is before the state law advisors for pre-certification. But what we agreed on chair is that the, the definition of communal land must then be removed from the bill as it, uh, it, it only occurs once, and minister is not really a competent authority in respect of communal land issues. Uh, Dalrat is developing that communal land bill, which will be the dedicated legislation on all communal land issues and communal land rights issues. So Chair, here then the proposal is to delete the definition of communal land. In that way, the, it, it will then also correct that in or address the issue of incorrect referencing. So that's the first proposal, Chair. The second uh, definition is that of fire in the open air. On this one, the if you look at the third column, there was input. I think this was also a recurring input for most of the provinces to say, let's uh, from that definition of fire in the open air. Uh, let's, let's then uh, change the word designed to designated. Let's replace the word designed to designated. I think this uh, input sort of was raised by quite a few provinces and we agreed with that approach. Uh, so if you look at the, at the new word, the old, old, the, the, that was the suggestion, but the provinces did not provide the text. So in the last column, we're then uh, proposing the text that the committee should must consider. Uh, so we agree that the word designed will then change to uh, designated. So uh, uh, such that the new definition now reads, fire in the open air uh, means any fire not within a building or structure but does not include a fire in an area specifically designated for such fire, protected against wind and spreading and maintained by the owner. So as you can see that chair, we've changed the wording designed and uh, change, uh, change it to designated. But in addition to that, we've proposed the additional wording uh, 
the word the wedding protected against wind and spreading so for completeness and to ensure that people are held accountable it's one thing to uh, make fire in a designated area but then it's another then to make sure that you put in in place the necessary the necessary measures to ensure that the fire the, the area is, is insulated against fire and the spreading thereof so we propose that the committee then adopts this re revised definition because it is more comprehensive and closes all bases. Then the third definition, uh, uh, it's at the start of the term in municipality. This one will remain as is, as there was no specific, specific proposal from the public participation process. Same with the following definition of public entity. There was no material input that would uh, lead to the change in the definition. The next definition is that of, uh, I'm trying to move the slides. The term, this act. Here, Chair, I think the, there was overwhelming support from the provinces that the the wording, I mean, the name of the act should be shortened, but there was no specific amendments that we will be additional for introduction this time around. The definition as it is in the amendment bill will stay. Uh, basically, we're amending the name of the act to being, instead of being the Felt and Forest Fire Act, uh, to being the Felt Fire Act of 1998. But this, was, this amendment has already been, cap been captured in the current version of the bill. The next amendment chair is the relates to the definition. I think there's the last two or three definitions. The definition of the term traditional council. Yeah, it's one of those incorrect reference, references that they were identified by the committee earlier in the year and uh, the public common period or if the provinces also raised the same concern to say, even the traditional and cohesion leadership act, I mean, the reference to the traditional leadership and governance framework act is, is really not correct. That act has been uh, replaced by the traditional and cohesion leadership act of May of 2019. So the, with the definition of traditional council chair, the pro we are proposing that uh, we then delete the reference to section one of the traditional leadership and governance framework act and instead re reference section one of the traditional and cohesion leadership act uh, the bill also has the definition of the term traditional leadership and governance framework act uh, we are proposing that that definition be deleted and instead we have a definition of the of the traditional and cohesion leadership act. So, Chair, I think the the, the last definition uh, what is around the definition of the term felt fire. Here, there was a comment. If you look at the third column. Uh, from uh, I think a few of the provinces, including the Western Cape, to say the way the the, the, the term felt fire is defined, it's got it's got loopholes. It doesn't cater for the rural and urban in, inter interface. Uh, so uh, just trying to. It doesn't cater for the rural and urban interface which then creates loopholes because the, the whole landscape in between the rural and urban areas is then discounted. So to close that loophole, we've then proposed the revised wording, the revised definition of the term felt fire. So the term now will read any vegetation fire that occurs outside a city, down its adjoining industrial or residential area, including any vegeta vegetation along any rural urban fringe of a city, town, and its adjoining industrial or residential area boundaries. 
So from the word in, including, that's the new insertion, such that the definition is comprehensive and it caters for, or it addresses the urban rural interfaces such as that by, by the provinces. So we request that the committee adopts this revised definition instead. Then in respect of clause two, Chair, the uh, the idea would close would close to uh, I think that we are doing two things then. The first input was around the incorrect referencing of legislation, in particular the traditional leadership and governance framework act. So we're correcting that and making sure that we're referencing the correct legislation, which is the traditional and cohesion leadership uh, act. But the second thing that we, the second change we're effecting here in close two is, is, is in relation to the use of the word in communal land. This is the only instance, as I said, with the definition, with the proposal to delete the definition. This is where the, the wording communal land occurs. It is the only place in the legislation or in the build where the wording communal land occurs. So here we're also proposing that that wording in the case of communal land be deleted. So those are the two things that are happening here with clause two. So the deletion of the wording in the case of communal land uh, will then correct the make sure that we complete the, the correct the, the, the correction of the in, incorrect reference. Uh, as I said, we discussed this approach with the Office of the Chief State Advisor. We exchanged notes, especially, and also with the Parliamentary Legal Advisor. And I, we, I think the, there's a meeting of minds that this is the correct approach to address this, especially because there is a communal land bill that is in the pipeline where Minister Dalra to be the competent authority to, on all land or communal land rights issues. Uh, so those are the two suggest uh, suggested uh, amendments in clause two, Chair. Then with clause three, clause three, there were no material amendments that uh, could be incorporated. So that clause will remain as is in the amendment bill. With clause four, with clause four, the, uh, proposed amendment there is to uh, then uh, make sure that we aligned with the Fire Brigade Services Act in terms of the use of terminology. There was input from uh, some of the provinces to say the reference to a chief fire officer is, may not be accurate in, in the circumstances. Let's rather use chief fire protection officer. So this is what we are doing. We are proposing here to say that reference to chief fire officer should then be deleted and substituted for the reference chief fire protection officer. So that wording is basically the standard wording that is used, used including in the Fire Brigade Services Act. So, uh, so Chair, as you can see there, if I go towards, towards the bottom, this is where we're then changing reference from chief fire officer to chief fire protection officer. So those, that is the only amendment uh, in clause four. In clause five, Chair, there's no uh, material, uh, material amendment that uh, can be in, incorporated at this stage. So the clause will remain as is in the amendment bill. Then in clause six, yeah, Chair, it's also just correcting the incorrect referencing of addressing the issue of incorrect referencing of, of legislation. Uh, so we, instead of saying section one of the traditional leadership and governance framework act, we now saying uh, section one of the 
of the traditional leadership, traditional and Khoisan leadership act of 2019. So we ask that the committee adopts this uh, revised wording. Then with clause uh, seven on appeals, as I said initially, Chair, the input that came through on appeals was that we must then factor in the timeframes, but we then responded in the last PC meeting to say timeframes, we suggest time, that timeframes be, be catered for in the regulations so that we are able to amend as and when is necessary. So the, there is no amendment in, with clause seven, the, the provision proposed that the that, that clause be processed as is in the amendment bill. Then uh, the last clause, clause eight, which is the short title here, there's no additional amendments proposed. The, this, that amendment will then remain as is in the bill. It's just to mention that there was overwhelming support from the provinces to, for us to then shorten the name of the act as the title uh, of the of the act, uh, the definition of failed fire or eradicators for forest fires as well. Uh, I know from the maybe your version you would have a clause nine, but then for after consultations with the office of the chief state advisor and the parliamentary advisor, legal advisor, we agreed that that clause is really not necessary because the, the amendment bill should remain the National Field and Forest Amendment Bill. So the, the, there's no need to change that. Thank you, Chair. I think that is the end of the presentation. Before I invite uh, inputs of honorable members, can I, can I, can I, I've been advised that the state law advisor is in this meeting. Um, just in case the department did their shenanigans uh, and inserted new things, uh, state law advisor, please come in and brief the committee if you're satisfied with all these amendments. Um, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, am I audible? Very, very audible. We just can't see you. <laughs> I'm going to attempt to start the video. Um, <coughs> person, if you would allow me, let me just. Can the members see me? We, we can see you now. We can see you now. Please proceed. Thank you, Chairperson. My name is Vionia Khrwetwam. Um, and I'm a senior state law advisor at the Office of the Chief State Law Advisor. Um, indeed, uh, Chairperson, we did discuss with the department um, and as, as he presented, it is so that um, these amendments were discussed and we agree with it. Um, so we have nothing to really add to what the department has already mentioned. Um, but we did indicate to the department that we are here to assist the committee with the A-list and, and the processing through of the poll further. That, that's fine, Ms. Krodbom. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, is the parliamentary law advisor here? No, Chair, uh, she's in another meeting, unfortunately. Okay, I just hope she won't differ with the senior state law advisor when she comes. Honorable members, um, I then present an opportunity for us to engage this presentation. Uh, Honorable Brian. Well, thank you very much, Chairperson. Uh, Chairperson, I've, I've uh, listened to the proposed amendments that have come through, and uh, I don't have any objection to any of them. I do think 
um, that it is worthwhile, um, again, mentioning uh, how uh, much work has been put in by the officials uh, concerned during the public hearings. And it is heartening to see that the considerations of the public have been taken uh, into, into consideration during uh, the drafting and the new proposed amendments. And um, I think it has assisted in um, adding that extra layer of bulk and consideration uh, uh, that's been given uh, to, the, uh, to the comments uh, that were received. So thank you from, from us effectively. Thanks, Jim. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Honorable Brian. Uh, Mr. Busiso, will you please please be kind to go back to slide eight? Slide eight, just just on clause five. Um, <laughs> Yes, there you say section 11 of the principal act is hereby amended by the substitution of paragraph A of uh, the South African Weather Bureau, uh, South African Weather Service established in terms of South African Weather Services Act of 2001. Now it speaks there about if the director general of the department of environmental affairs and tourism, do we, do we still have such? Mm. Yes, yeah, I'm sure, uh, I'm sure the state law advisor can also assist there. Chair, if I may, Chair. I can hear you in that discussion. Oh, okay. No, thank you, Chair. No, if you notice, Chair, that. That reference to environmental affairs and tourism is in bold and in bracketed, meaning it's been deleted. And that is already captured already in the amendment bill. So that, that wording is being deleted, it's being removed. Oh, no, no, I saw your recommendation saying plus five to remain as is in the amendment bill. But if that is, if that is the reference you're making to then I think I'm, I'll sleep peacefully. Uh, is that the view of uh, Ms. Khrutbo? Um, thank you, Chairperson. Um, yes, it is my view, Chairperson. Is you, as you would note in the beginning of an amendment bill, that words in square brackets uh, is omissions from existing enactments, and therefore that is a deletion indeed, Chairperson. Wonderful. <clears throat> Wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, honorable members, are we comfortable with this uh, presentation? Are we, are we content? Yes, Chair. Nice. Uh, well, that's that's about it. Um, uh, Gift, the minister has not joined us as yet. Chairperson, the minister has not joined us yet. Not, not at all. You'll tell her that the apology is not accepted. How will you check? Yes, um, and hopefully that you will also transmit all the resolutions together with the DG. Zoni will do the same with the deputy minister. Uh, yes, with, that, uh, with that being said, honorable members, let me take this opportunity to thank you. That brings us to the end of uh, the meeting of the Portfolio Committee on Forestry, Fisheries and Environment. We have exhausted all the agenda items today. Um, thank you once again to all the participants, all the presenters, everybody who attended the uh, meeting. Uh, thank you very much, and the meeting stands adjourned.
Thank, Thank you, Chair. Can I come in? Can I come in, Chair? Sorry. Yeah. Chair, like I said, meeting tomorrow. Yes, yes, there's a meeting tomorrow, but uh, Chair, on the um the way forward now uh, with regards to the bill, uh, maybe Ms. Hrodbom uh, can um uh, indicate to the committee uh, as, as to when the A-list will be ready. Obviously, it won't be this year. That would mean that in the first meeting when we come back next year, we'll have to look at the uh, A-list and consider it, but I'm not sure whether during the holidays, um, she'll be able to send it to the committee so that members, when we come back, they have gone through it. And then we move so that we can um, adopt the bill and finalize it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Ms. Rodbo. <coughs> um, yes, Chair, um, this is not gonna be a very long A list, so we would be able to assist the committee. So the committee don't have any meetings in this year on this bill anymore? No. no. Okay. So we would be able to assist the, the, the to have the, um, at least a proposed A list for the committee to consider so that when the committee returns, then it has something to agree to. All right, I, th I think that should be fine. Um, uh, I, I, I suggest that uh, whenever you get time, even if it's this year late, uh, so that we interface with it, prepare thoroughly, and then when we come um, um, next year, we, we finalize it. Agreed? Uh, agreed, Chairperson. Okay. Um, any other view? Should, are we done? Yeah, Chairperson, sorry, just my apologies for tomorrow. Uh, we're receiving Parapala tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> At 10 o'clock. <laughs> Your apology is noted, Honorable uh, uh, C. Uh, with, that, with that apology, um, uh, we will get uh, better details privately from Honorable C on any other issue that is not in these uh, items uh, and this committee. Uh, thank you very much, honorable members, and we close the meeting in that space. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Recording stopped. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members. Thank you, Chair.